it looks like a sine wave and it sounds like a sine wave. But differentiating it shows that it's not a sine wave. Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Last time, we discussed in detail the op-amp integrator, including how to make a deal with the flaws that it exposes in op-amps. This time, I'd like to turn the integrator on its head and make an op-amp differentiator. Just as the integrator began as an RC low-pass filter, the differentiator begins as an RC high-pass filter. And just as the passive integrator worked only if the output voltage was much less than the input voltage, the passive differentiator works only if the output voltage changes much more slowly than the input voltage. Continuing to do the same thing we did with the integrator, we can get rid of the restriction by using an op-amps feedback loop to put the middle node of the RC network at a virtual ground. The current through the capacitor must balance the current through the feedback resistor, and we know how to find both currents. When we set them equal, we can solve for the output voltage, and ideally the circuit should be precisely a differentiator, provided that all the voltages stay within range. So let's design one here. I'll choose nice round values for the resistor and capacitor, and I'll feed the circuit with a 1 kHz, 1 volt triangle wave from my AWG. That gives a rate of change of plus or minus 2 kilovolts per second. 100K times 10 nanofarad times plus or minus 2 kilovolts per second is plus or minus 2 volts, so I expect to see a 4 volt peak to peak square wave at the output. Before we build this, let's give it a quick sanity check in CircuitJS. That looks pretty good. There's a little bit of spikiness at the transitions. That's probably got something to do with the discrete time steps that CircuitJS uses. Let's try building it. I've got it here on the breadboard. I'll turn it on and... What the heck? I don't know what to call that mess but it definitely is not a 4-volt square wave. What happened? Before we continue, let me interrupt for a few moments. My videos are always free to all comers. Nothing is ever paywalled, and I don't waste your time selling various dodgy products. But I do end every video with a plea that you take care of one another. To this end, all the channel's ad revenue has gone to charity. This month's featured recipient is Made Saint-Francois Saint Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. MSF is an independent international organization that offers medical humanitarian aid to people based solely on need, without regard to race, religion, gender, or political affiliation. It provides over 10 million consultations annually in more than 70 countries including some of the regions most torn by violence, neglect, or catastrophe. And it trains health workers and invests in local infrastructure to meet health care needs sustainably in a community-driven way. I'm asking my viewers to join me in supporting this organization. This is a small channel, so I've set a modest goal of $500. Those $500 could provide two treatments to cure patients of hepatitis C, four resuscitators for non-invasive ventilation in newborns, or enough vaccine to immunize nearly 1,400 children against measles during a deadly outbreak. We managed to meet our goal in the last fundraiser, so I'm sure that my wonderful viewers can get us there again. Won't you please join me today? Thank you so very much. The problem is something we've seen several times before. If we have a different signal at the input to the op-amp, it will be delayed some when it passes through the op-amp. How much? Well, let's look at the data sheet for the TL071 op-amp we're using. It has a Bode plot of the open-loop response of the amplifier. One thing that we see in it is that the op-amp has a nearly constant 90-degree phase shift over a wide range of frequencies. Let's remember that as we go back to our circuit. Whatever the phase delay is, the RC network and the feedback loop is going to add another 90 degree phase shift to the total. If the phase shift around the feedback loop totals 180 degrees, we've just converted our negative feedback to positive feedback. 
If the loop gain is at least unity of that frequency, we've made an oscillator. Another way of putting it is if the overall gain of the circuit is very large at a given frequency, and the phase shift around the loop is anywhere near 180 degrees of that frequency, then the slightest amount of noise at that frequency in the input will make the circuit put out a large signal, and with the circuit close to positive feedback, the large signal will take a long time to ring down. And the naive differentiator that we just built has its gain increase without bound as the input frequency increases. Even though the op-amp open-loop gain is falling off at the same 6 decibel per octave over the frequency range, there's virtually certain to be some frequency where this thing will oscillate. So why didn't we see this in simulation? Because I just told CircuitJS to put an ideal op-amp in the circuit. The ideal op-amp doesn't have any delay between input and output. Let's switch that out and put in a real op-amp instead. Here I'm using a 741 because CircuitJ's choices are limited. Now CircuitJS is showing the same oscillations that we saw on the breadboard. This is a mirror image of the problems we had with the integrator. There, the infinite gain of the circuit at DC led to tough problems with drifts caused by voltage offsets and bias currents. Any non-zero offset at the input caused an endlessly shifting voltage at the output. Here, instead, we have gain increasing without bound the farther from DC that we get, and we have problems with the huge gain at high frequencies triggering oscillations from any sudden change. With the integrator, we had to roll off the DC gain with a feedback resistor, which caused problems tracking slow-moving signals. We also learned about a few clever tricks to keep the DC voltage centered. With the differentiator, we don't have as many clever tricks available. We don't have much choice other than rolling off the gain at high frequencies, which will limit our ability to track fast-changing signals. We do this in two ways. First, we can add a small resistor to the input. If we look at the circuit's behavior at very high frequencies, the input capacitor looks like a short circuit. The remaining components form an inverting amplifier with a gain of negative R2 over R1, or 100 for these component values. The gain won't increase past that value. We wind up with a Bode plot for the overall circuit that looks like this. We no longer have the gain increasing without bound, so maybe the op amp's internal compensation will keep things stable. We'll put that resistor into our simulation. And, well, it looks somewhat more stable. Let's try it in real life. Let's add that resistor to our breadboard circuit and try again. The output is at least a recognizable square wave but the circuit is still only borderline stable. There's still a fair amount of overshoot and ringing, including an oscillation at some higher frequency that just won't settle down. And there's nothing for it but to roll off the high frequency response even more. We add a compensation capacitor to the feedback path. Now if we look at the circuit's behavior at moderately high frequencies, the input capacitor still looks like a short circuit, but the compensation capacitor is still very much in play. At those frequencies, the circuit looks like the integrator that we built in the last episode. The gain should roll off at 6 decibels per octave. Here's the Bode plot of what I expect to see. The circuit should behave like a differentiator up to 10 kHz or so, and then have a smooth transition to behaving like an integrator at high frequencies. That ought to tame the oscillations. Adding the capacitor does appear to settle things at least a little. Let's try adding that capacitor to our setup. There's still a small amount of overshoot, 
but now we're facing a trade-off between that and a slow rise time. I think this is about as good as we're going to do. The performance of the practical differentiator is a little disappointing, but it's a fact of life. We need to limit the bandwidth to get stability. A faster op-amp, that is, one that has a higher transition frequency while still being unity gain compensated, might give us a faster response by letting us use smaller values for the input resistor and compensation capacitor. I'm not going to get into all the details of the stability analysis here, because stability analysis is a whole other topic that I want to cover in a later episode. Instead, let's put this differentiator through its paces. If we give it a sine wave, we get a cosine. Give it a square wave, and the output is a series of impulses, alternately positive and negative. These impulses saturate the op-amp and charge the capacitor, and the circuit is slow to recover from saturation. A version with a much smaller capacitor could be used as something like a gate-to-trigger converter. Give it a triangle wave, we get a square wave. Give it a ramp, and there's a constant positive derivative, punctuated by impulses when the ramp resets. I should mention that one subtle thing to watch out for is that feeding a digitally generated signal into a differentiator is asking for trouble unless there's an anti-aliasing filter. For instance, a stair-step triangle gives a confused mess of impulses rather than the square wave we might want to see. We had a similar issue if we tried to differentiate the signal coming from the sine shaper that we built a few episodes ago. We actually approximated the sine function with a series of line segments, which we were able to produce with a diode ladder. The resulting curve is something that's nearly indistinguishable on the oscilloscope from a real sine wave, and it doesn't look all that bad on the FFT display either. But let's look at what the differentiator reveals. We can see at least a few distinct stair steps where the slope of the sine approximation changes abruptly. I don't know what to name this shape, but it reminds me of the Pyramid of Djoser, so I'll call it a Djoseroid for now. I can't quite pick out all the steps of the diode ladder, but we already knew that the ladder rounds off the corners between the straight lines. It appears that our differentiator is good enough to demonstrate the flaws of our sine shaper. Because avoiding instability means the differentiators have to be fairly slow, they're not as widely used as integrators. Still, they're a critical component in most analog motion controls, which are generally PID controls, which stands for proportional, integral, and derivative. I'll definitely cover those at some point, but first I want to cover some more of the op-amp basics. Next time, I want to use the principle of gain roll-off, which we've now seen in both integrators and differentiators, to attack another circuit, the high-gain AC amplifier. I'll use a microphone preamp as an example. I hope you'll stay tuned for that, and perhaps give the YouTube algorithm a hint that you'd like to see it. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!